guys, and we are going to start um, this unit off in Chapter 17. Um, today we're going to be talking about the wave nature of light. So this whole past chapter with all of our ray diagrams and our ray tracings and understanding how light refracts, that was all under the assumption that light was moving as a ray. So today we're going to switch gears and focus on the wave model of light. Although we know that light exists both as a wave and a particle. Uh, we're going to talk about how they discovered the fact that light is a wave. And then um, the unit after this, we talk about the particle model in modern physics. So around 1830, uh, most scientists had accepted that the wave theory of light, uh, and it wasn't until early 20th century when they first discovered that light had a particle. So let's talk about the big discovery that helped us figure out that light actually moves as a wave. And it all has to do with an experiment that's called Young's Double Slit Experiment. And this experiment becomes the basis for this entire unit. This idea that this uh, young scientist, his name was Thomas Young, um, what he did was he had a um, partition here that had two very small slits cut in it, and they were very, very closely spaced. And what he noticed was that when light or the sun um, shone through, shined through these slits, it created a particular pattern on the screen behind the slits. So we call this the wave interference phenomenon. And the only way that it would have been possible to see this really bright pattern that I'm about to show you is if light traveled as a wave. So there were two possibilities at the time that Young did his experiment. The first possibility was that light might consist of really tiny particles. And if the light fell through these openings, then it would just continue onward and make two single solitary dots of light on the screen behind the slits. That was option number one. The second option that might happen is that light actually is a wave and spreads outward as it passes through these openings. This uh, phenomenon of light spreading out as it goes through an opening is a process called diffraction. And we're going to talk more about that specifically later. But if light was a wave, then it would spread out to fill this entire area. And you would have regions where the two waves that came through these slits overlapped with one another. So, instead of seeing just two single solitary dots of light, what Young observed was a whole bunch of different lines on the screen behind the slits. Super, super important for physics. So what he discovered, here's another little, uh, kind of a blurry image, but um, the light passes through this double slit right here, and then it spreads out through diffraction, right? That's what diffraction is, is spreading out of the light waves as it passes through. Uh, and so it spreads out, and it hits the screen behind it. Well, what's going on is that Young observed these patterns of really bright strips and really dark strips alternating all along the screen. And this pattern comes from wave interference. And you guys probably learned about this last year in AP1, or at least I hope you remembered it from AP1. Um, this idea that whenever light waves superimpose on one another, Right, or whenever light or whenever any waves superimpose on one another and occupy the same space, they can do so either constructively and create a constructive interference, or they can do it destructively and create destructive interference. So here's a little uh, animated GIF here to show you kind of how constructive and destructive works. But if we look at this wave here at the top, it's pretty much it's exactly stationary. And then as this wave moves right here, you have a region of constructive interference. So the resulting wave will actually be much larger. Remember that for waves to be constructive, um, they need to have the same amplitude and be uh, traveling on the same side of the medium. And then for waves to be destructive, like right here, um, let's wait till it happens again over here on the side. Right here we have destructive, and you could have seen that it was a perfectly flat line because the waves have equal amplitude but on opposite sides of the medium. So essentially they're, they are canceling each other out for a super brief moment. 
And then, of course, the resulting wave gets larger again as the bottom wave continues to propagate. But this is just a review of the difference between constructive and destructive interference. So again, constructive, we have an overlap of the waves. Uh, and what we say uh, for this experiment is that for constructive interference to occur, there needs to be a whole wavelength difference. So if you guys remember from AP1, let me get my little marker here so I can draw. From crest to crest or trough to trough is what we consider to be a wavelength. Or you can also do it from two equal points of energy on the wave, and it's a wavelength. But these waves in this picture can be one whole wavelength apart from one another, meaning that I can pick this bottom wave up and shift it over one complete wavelength. So I can pick this guy up and move it to right here, and the wave would continue to be in constructive interference. Destructive interference happens whenever there is a half a wavelength difference between the two waves. So here you can see they add together and create a much larger wave. Here you can see they're essentially subtracting from one another, um, and they cancel each other out completely. So half wavelength difference, same thing over here. These two waves are approximate or exactly a half a wavelength apart in their propagation. So we call this being in phase, and we call this being out of phase. All right, so let's go back to Young's double slit experiment and talk a little bit more about what he saw and what it meant. So Young saw these regions of super bright light um, alternating between these really dark strips. And what he was observing was he was observing regions of constructive interference with the bright regions and destructive interference with the dark regions. So this is how he first started to piece together this idea that light is a wave because only waves can form interference patterns. The fact that they do is a key characteristic of a wave, is the fact that they can make interference patterns. So he noticed this interference pattern and he realized that light must be behaving as a wave in order to do this. So constructive interference occurs whenever he saw the bright regions. And then destructive interference occurred wherever he saw the darker regions. So, when you look at uh, a double slit experiment interference pattern, like if you were to look at the screen, this is what you would see, right? And you kind of see that the intensity or the brightness of the interference patterns kind of gets dimmer as you go away from the center. So he called this center uh, constructive interference pattern the central maximum. And that is the brightest uh, strip that you will see in the interference pattern. And then to either side of it, we have what's called borders. And those M's are uh, orders, I guess, is a, is a good way to say it. So we'll say of the first order is M1, second order is M2 third order is M3. So they go up 1, 2, 3, 4 on the top and then on the down on the bottom they go down 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, so they are going to be equidistant from the center. So what that means is that the distance between this 1 and 0 is the same as the distance between this 1 and 0. And the distance between this 0 and this 2 is the same as the, diff the distance between this 0 and this 2. All right, so let's look a little bit at the geometry of what's happening here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so I uh, just wanted to make sure that I had that picture in the next slide before I drew it. So let's think about what's happening uh, mathematically with, with what's going on. So the light waves are coming out of this slit opening here, and they are doing their wavy thing, and they are traveling along. But remember that these wavelengths are essentially coming out from all regions and angles, right? And the light that comes from the bottom is also doing that same thing. And when the light waves that come from the bottom are half a wavelength difference between the ones that come out from the top, you're going to get a region of 
destructive interference. Now, when the light waves that are coming out of the bottom match up to be exactly in phase or a wavelength apart from the ones on the top, you end up with a bright or constructive interference. All right, so to kind of minimize the picture here a little bit, um, we're going to draw our light waves, not as waves per se, but just as two these two strips of purple light. So essentially, this is our geometry. We have our double slit here, and then we have our viewing screen. And the distance between these two things is going to become very important, and that's what we're going to label as our L value. So when light comes through these two slits and it meets up at this point here, some height above the center maximum that we're going to call y. Because we typically denote heights as y, so that's what we're going to do here. So if we look at our triangle that we have essentially drawn between this midline and the angle between our light rays that are eventually going to meet up, here's our angle then what we can see is that this height of my triangle would be equal tangent of theta, right, here's our theta, opposite over adjacent, or y over l. So the height that we would observe this destructive or constructive order at would be l tangent theta. All right, so however far apart these two are, the path length, right? We call that the path length difference between the first one and the, uh, and the second uh, light ray. The angle that is between them here can help us discover this path length. And that path length difference will tell us if it is constructive or destructive. Remember that if this path length difference, this little r, is a wavelength or a multiple, a whole entire wavelength, or a multiple of a wavelength, we're going to have constructive. If that path difference is a half a wavelength difference, then we're going to have destructive. So, this becomes our relationship or our formula that we will use to help us figure out where the bright fringes on a double slit interference pattern can be found. So we have d sine theta equals m times lambda. Lambda is our wavelength, and m is the order, right? Are we looking for the central maximum? Are we looking for the first order, second order, or third order along the interference pattern? So um, D is the slit spacing, which becomes important because the if you start to change that, that's going to change the picture that you see on the screen behind uh, the uh, slits. So. Um, this, I believe, is on your formula chart. I'm not entirely sure that the second one is, though. We can also take this information and we can write it in terms of the distance for the bright fringes from the center of the screen or from the central maximum. So this will help us to figure out things such as slit spacing, or maybe we need to find the angle between the two light rays, or maybe we need to find what order of interference pattern it is that we're actually looking at. This bottom formula will help us to figure out the y, or the height, for these interference, or for these orders. So if I'm looking for how high above the central maximum the first order would appear, then I could use this formula to figure that out. All right, I'm going to do this example with you guys, and then I'm going to stop. But uh, light from a laser 
eliminates two slits that are spaced 0.4 millimeters apart. Viewing screen is two meters behind the slits. A bright fringe is observed at a point 9.5 millimeters from the center of the screen. What is the fringe number? And how much further does the wave from one slit travel to this point than the wave from the other slit? All right, so here we go. Let me change it to... Uh, All right, so uh, we have our wavelength, which is 633 nanometers. We have our slit spacing, which they've told us is 0.4 millimeters apart. And the viewing screen is two meters behind the slit. So remember that is our L in our geometry from our picture before. A bright fringe is observed at a point. So we're just gonna say bright, bright equals 9.5 millimeters from the center of the screen. So what is the front, the order number? Sometimes I also call them fringe numbers. And how much further does the wave from one slit travel to this point than the wave from the other slit? So we have, we can use this guy to help us figure this out. Because we have our Y value, right? This is telling us if this is our screen, if this is our central maximum here at zero, this is telling us that this point appears 9.5 millimeters above the central maximum. So that becomes our Y value. And when we put that in, uh, one, two, yeah, maybe you get 0 0.0095. So 0 0.0095, they're asking us for our order, so that would be our M. Our wavelength is 633 times 10 to the negative ninth, and our length is two meters. Our distance, not in scientific notation, I'm just going to leave that there. All right, so when we divide all that out, we get that our order of this uh, particular bright speck of light is three. So we are looking at the third bright strip of light above the center. And so now we know that these things will be a whole wavelength apart from one another. And the question is asking, what is the extra distance that one wavelength travels. Well, since they're a whole wavelength apart from one another, we're looking for our path length difference, or how much further one wave has to travel than the other one. So they are a, a multiple of a wavelength apart from each other, and that multiple is your order. So change in R equals 633 times 10 to the negative ninth times three. All right, so that means that these waves, one wave rather, has to travel 1.9 times 10 to the negative sixth meters further than the other one. All right, and I'm going to stop it there for now, guys. We'll do much more practice problems when uh, I see you in class.